at the pinnacle of his power, a man who risks losing control. The world is not kind, so its king has become cruel. Murder is never mercy, it's never noble, and it's never redeemable. To the maniac, murder is an art form. Welcome back to Visited by Voices Live. We're here on another matinee Saturday. I'm joined today by Mr. Luca. I'm going to I'm going to mess up this last name and embarrass myself. But uh, Barakovici. Well done. Ah, I think it's the first time I've done it well. Uh, Luca is uh, very. His work is very well known to fans of this channel. Uh, he is the creator and director of the first Ghoulies movie which was a seminal film in the Empire Films canon. He also has an IMDb resume that goes on longer than most toilet paper rolls, but is of a lot higher quality. <laughs> so, Luca, how are you doing today? Yeah, we're, I'm hanging in there. We're, we're um, like everybody else, we're fighting the good fight. Yeah, every day does seem like a fight, and I think it's at these times that these uh, little movies from decades past really start to shine in our eyes because it reminds us of a time when the world was simpler and what we wanted out of our entertainment wasn't so bogged down by a million messages. I wanted Before we talk about Ghoulies in particular, though, I wanted to talk about your relationship with the horror genre. I know that you've done work in almost every genre, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, with such a, a robust career, it would, wouldn't be a big surprise if the horror genre was not central to who you are as a person, but it certainly was a big boon to your career. So where is your relationship with the genre at this point? Okay, so I have a very sort of strange relationship with, with, with the horror genre. Um, and anybody who knows the quote-unquote horror movies that I've made, um, namely you know, Ghoulies, followed by Rockula, followed by the Granny in that genre, um, we'll, we'll see something uh, in common, uh, a common element in all of those movies. Um, and, and that is that it doesn't take the genre that seriously. Now, that was not entirely the, that was not the initial thrust or desire. In other words, both both Ghoulies and Rockula were supposed to be w much more serious and cleave closer to the genre than they ended up being. And each for their own reasons ended up being sort of imbued with this like offbeat, wacky, you know, insane kind of sensibility, um, which we very much enjoyed. And um, and I think that they it, actually, in a funny way, it, it cleaved closer to sort of the empire fair that was being put out there, which was all really kind of silly at the end of the day um, and didn't take itself all that seriously, even though all of us as filmmakers, we don't go in there and go, hey, let's go make a bad movie. We're out there trying to make the best movie that we can under the time and circumstances um and money um but uh so ghoulies ended up fitting really kind of hand in glove with the rest of the stuff that charlie was making at the time um and you know look here it is what is it 30 years or something 35 years since ghoulies i think it's yeah. like 35 years and here we are like talking about it and we, you know, you couldn't have told me back then that that was going to happen. I mean, that was, you know, that's extraordinary. So my, my relationship with horror, I always wanted 
to make a straight horror movie. That was the intention for Ghoulies. That was the intention for Rockula. The Granny, not so much. The Granny was kind of going to be tongue in cheek anyway, because the premise was just so outlandish. But um, uh, and you know, so but this was these were the this was the path that we ended up having to go down, and we went down it you know, without hesitation, and we made the best of it under the circumstances. And um, one of these days, and I've written, I've written other uh, horror movies uh, that, you know, have yet to get made. But one of these days, I would like to do a straight, straight ahead, like real bona fide, you know, horror movie that fit the genre. But that opportunity just hasn't uh, arrived yet. I think that uh, you have nothing to worry about as far as your legacy in the genre, though. I mean, um, it's it might heavily rest on Ghoulie's shoulders, but would you believe that a, a little movie that was produced in the Bad Empire would endure for as long as it has? And of the films produced by Charles Band, Ghoulie's is kind of the touchstone. It's it's if if there is that Marvel uh, opening credit reel where as they go through their superheroes. For, for Empire Pictures, the ghoulie coming out of the toilet is the first image in that role. Right, and but and then the second one would be Reanimator. I think Reanimator, the, the, the Reanimator shows where, right. I mean, arguably, like, they were better movies, quite, to be really quite honest with you. I mean, the, but, but we, you know, Ghoulies was uneven for reasons that we can get into, uh, mainly because, it started off being one thing, and then just before production started, it turned into something else. Um, but Reanimator kind of like, and and it too was, uh, was kind of sort of a goofy, um, had its had its you know, it oh, was yeah. Jeffrey Combs, you know, it was, it was you know, it was big, you know. I mean, it, it was, was broad. Sort of, it was a yeah, very broad take on Lovecraft. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. It was a very broad take on Lovecraft's so, broadest story too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so Ghoulies was the one that really hit it out of the park for Charlie. Um, and, you know, who, and nobody, you can't predict this stuff. It just happens, you know, it just, it just happens. So, um, and listen, I'm grateful. I'm happy. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice. It's nice that, um, you know, Ghoulies went Blu-ray. It's nice that um, uh, that Rockula went Blu-ray. I'm trying to get Granny's Blu-ray as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but it's really it's really nice that it, and I mean it's really nice that it had some sort of like cultural. It had some sort of impact on the cultural zeitgeist that people actually grew up with this stuff, and it became kind of woven into the fabric of their childhood. You know, how cool is that? It's very cool. So Christian Hannah Horror in the chat has, has two questions. I want, I want to focus on the first one for a second. He says, Mr. Luca, where did your relationship with Charlie Band begin? Um, but let's so take us back in 1984. Um, clearly, there was some rumblings of gremlins having made a lot of money the year before, right? No. So no? Here, here's the deal. So to answer that question directly, I worked with Charlie on a movie called Parasite with mm -hmm. Demi Moore and, um, you know, Sherry Curry and um, Al Fan and, uh, and Scott Thompson. And, and um, uh, we discovered as we were talking that we had, we had a shared history. Um, he and I both um, grew up in Rome and we both went to the same school. He's a couple of, he's a few years older than I am. Um, but we both went to the same school and we both had sort of the same sort of childhood experience in Rome uh, in the 60s. And so we there was sort of a kinship that that blossomed there. So when Jeffrey and I, Jeff, Jeff Levy and I came up with, we said, let's come up with a one location horror movie, right? And so we came up with this, the story that was originally, the, the original story, the darker story um, and I said, I'm going to go pitch this to Charlie Band. And Charlie Band just bit like this, right? And so literally overnight, Charlie 
said, great. And Jeffrey and I wrote the script in 10 days. Um, and it was, it was, it was a dark, dark piece, you know, and, and, and some of those elements are still in the movie. You're talking about infanticide, you're talking about patricide, you're talking about satanic rituals, you're talking about really dark, dark stuff. So um, it really uh, was a much darker thing initially. Um, and um, now here's the thing. We were in production at the same time as Gremlins, okay? And we had heard about them and they had heard about us. And in fact, uh, Warner Brothers sued us over the name, right? Yeah. And um, so the, time, the, the timeline goes like this. We had shut down like, I don't know, we were th th three quarters of the way through production and Charlie ran short on payroll and the crew quit and we shut down for a number of months. I mean, this is like, you know, okay, okay this happened. You know, yeah, this, this happened. And um, Charlie decided at that point that he was going to delay the release. We, we got back on our feet. We finished the movie and Charlie decided that he was going to uh, delay release until October because for Halloween and, and all of that, because it was, there was sort of a Halloween kind of, vibe to the movie gremlins came out before us but we were in the can at the same time now as a follow-up story flash forward years later i get a call from my uh I get a call from my agent to to go in an audition for a movie called inner space <laughs> directed by joe dante, dante right i go and i go god joe dante because i've been a fan of joe dante's forever i mean how can he you not be his, you know, he imbues his horror movies, you know, like uh, um, with, you know, such a wicked sense of humor, you know what I mean? And so I walked in to the audition and the first thing that Joe Dante said to me was like, you know, because he kind of talked like, <laughs> he goes, no, we were going to put a Ghoulies poster up there. And, you know, like you go through these things and you make these movies and stuff and you think that nobody really pays attention. But Joe Dante knew exactly that we had made Ghoulies and, you know, we, we hit it off. Um, there's a whole long story that goes on beyond that. But the fact of the matter is, and this is, this is the gospel, is that we were at, this was not a Gremlins ripoff. We were in production at the same time as Gremlins. Um, Joe Dante just did it far better than we were ever capable of doing it. You know what I mean? So... Well, there was a big, a little bit of difference in budget there, huh? Yeah, a little bit. A yeah. little bit, right? A little bit. Uh, resources kind of open up when your executive producer is like the king of Hollywood. And yeah. Um, yeah. Charlie Brand was a king of his own empire, no pun intended, but yes. um, it, it was more in the suburbs. <laughs> if, if, and that's being kind. <laughs> yeah, it probably is. <laughs> yeah, that's so being kind. I think a lot of people don't have a real idea of what the Empire uh, productions really were like. Um, I think we we tend to think of all films being made kind of the same way. Can you paint a picture as, for us of a typical day on an Empire lot? Um, you know, listen, it was... Yeah, I mean, I'll give you like sort of one example. Like we were, um, when we were in production, um, Charlie was it doing reshoots on Metal Storm, I think, and he took he took our cameras over the weekend. He took he took our <laughs> cameras over the weekend to go shoot Metal Storm, um, and they brought the cameras back. And you know the, the camera department came to me and said, "These fucking cameras are fucked. The, you know they're fucked. They got sand in them. They're like totally <laughs> fucked. You know, blah blah blah. You know." So it was like that. It was sort of like. It was like Roger Corman on steroids. You know, it was like you were working for cheap and you knew it. And there was no pretense about that at all. Um, I have to tell you, though, that, you know, I, I worked with some great, great people. Betsy Magruder, who was my first AD, was awesome. Um, she went on to do great things. Um, Everett Burrell was one of the guys with his hands up the Ghoulies, but you know, like this, and he's gone on to be become like um, 
you know, a VFX supervisor for like big, 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 big shows. I reunited with him on A Good Day to Die Hard, which was awesome. In fact, we were doing a, a, a Skype meeting and, um, and he, it's like everybody in Los Angeles and it, we were in Hungary at the time, everybody in Hungary. And he goes, wait, is that Luca Bercovici? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, so a day on a day in the life of a, a, a empire shoot was um, problem solving, having a lot of fun, um, and um, in, uh, punctuated by moments of frustration because things like there being no money and crew getting pissed off and that kind of stuff. So low budget filmmaking. Yeah. How, how involved was Charlie band in the, in the process? He pretty much left us alone. I mean, once we had, once I had dialed in the ghoulies thing with Beekler, with John Beekler, rest in peace. Um, and he pretty much left us alone. Now, um, yeah, he pretty much left us left us alone. I mean, I think he came to the set a couple of times, but you know, he was not Mister, you know, hands on. Um, he was not. He was not like some other producers I've been I've worked for. The, the reputation seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'd love to be wrong on this, um, that he was more involved on the script side. And once something was ready to go before the cameras, he did take a step back. Would you say that's yeah. closer to you? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I've, I've sort of danced around it, but um, it was really, honestly, and I don't mean this in the pejorative at all, because uh, I don't mean this in the pejorative at all, but you know, it was really when we saw the Ghoulies for the first time about two or three weeks out from production that it was like, wow, uh, these really kind of aren't scary. These are kind of <laughs> cute and dorky and they're kind of funny. And then we started riffing on that. I'm going, what, what are the crazy fucking things that we could get these things to do? You know what are the what are the crazy you know we can have them like vomit you know vegetable soup and you know and that's where the the, the toilet thing can play the piano and the, the toilet thing oh we came up with tons of tons of gags ghouly gags um uh because that it's i mean that's what these things called for you know um and um once Charlie saw that stuff. He like he loved it. He loved it. He just said, "This is great." So, so did the ghoulies themselves become a bigger part of the picture at that point? Um, if you get if you look at the picture, you you see that they're kind of almost an afterthought. You know what I mean? It's not really about the ghoulies. No, it's so, a sorcerer movie. Yeah, it's a sorcerer movie exactly, um, and. So it, this is one of these sort of accidental things that happen that, you know, the, the supporting player takes over the movie in a sense. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and and um, it really wasn't by design. It was just by happenstance. Um, and uh, and, and we, we went with it at the time and it ended up being the right thing um, in the, in the um, in the sequels, they've made it more, much more ghouly centric because they clearly were the stars of the, of the, of the piece. But in in the original Ghoulies, no, they were they were kind of they were secondary. They were you know they were supporting in, players. In a weird way, they're almost the Greek chorus of the movie. They're kind yeah. of informing informing you how you're supposed to react to the main storyline. Yeah, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah. I wanted to um and and don't worry, we'll we'll get to your opinion of Ghoulies 4 eventually. But um, I wanted to ask about Richard Band's uh, contribution to the film. 
Um, he's great. Richard Band was great. He was really he, Richard Band and Shirley Walker were were awesome and um, had and gave it the right sort of buoyant kind of like you know like they 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 knew what they had and they were playing to it and so the music didn't fight the the material at all you know it went right with it uh, hand in glove i think richard unfortunately sometimes gets um um he doesn't get the reputation he deserves from a lot of quarters people tend to say well he was derivative or, or he was repetitive with this course but you hit it what i was going to say to you which is i think he captured tone with everything he did so well yes. yeah I, uh, I agree. and i i think he just doesn't get the call outs that he deserves yeah um, on Gremlins, you actually got to work with the legendary Jack Nance. On, on Ghoulies. Yeah. 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 With Jack um, Nance. Yes. Yeah. So that's um, kind of an amazing. We have a huge uh, pro David Lynch component to our audience. Um, can you talk to us about working with him? What was his approach? Uh, there's well, lots of stories I mean, about him as an actor. So. Yeah. I mean, so that's not by accident because you know that the our casting director, Joanna Ray, Mm -hmm. was David Lynch's casting director, yeah. right? So yeah. all of those, all of those great characters, Keith Joe Dick, Jack Nance, Michael DeBar, you know, Mariska Har Hargitay, you know, Lisa Pelican, all of those great actors, great kooky offbeat kind of actors um, were, you know, are, are, are Lynchian in, you know what I mean? Very much so. And Jack Nance was, he was, how do I describe him? He was a trip, man. He was just like, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. You know, he was like really, you know, just kind of like, uh, he was having fun at the time. He, he, was, he was having fun. Um, he was, you know, he showed up. Uh, he uh, was, we, we played to his intensity a lot, you know, um, and uh, yeah, how can you not, right? Um, and we just kind of let him run with, you know, we gave him sort of the, 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 the backstory and, and he just ran with it. On the other side of the coin, you uh, Bobby Breezy, or Bobby Breezy, yeah. um, obviously brought in for very different reasons than you bring in a Jack Nance. Um, but that also brings to mind a question. Was the movie always designed to be kind of a PG-13 before PG-13? Or was there a point where an R rating was considered for the film? No. As far as approach? Yeah, no. I mean, I mean, I think that, I think you get that one breast shot and that was it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and um, she was brought in for exactly the reason why you think she was do you know what i mean was for it was a cameo it was for that particular gag which was a good one you know the sort of the tongue thing and the yeah. you know all of that um that's been ripped off a lot from you guys by the way yeah well, a lot <laughs> yeah um and um yeah i mean listen you know she was um I don't think, I think she was the only cameo. I think, I think she was really the only cameo. I mean, listen, uh, I mean, the, uh, sort of an unsung player is Tammy Detro, who played one of the, who played Grizzle or Greedy Gut, I forget, one of the two little people um, who, you know, of ET fame, do you know what I mean? Um, and um she was awesome she was just she was just a kick in the pants um but bobby brzee was really the only kind of like cameo sort of thing so it was always meant as kind of a um teenage matinee type film absolutely yeah absolutely i mean that's who that was charlie that's charlie's audience yeah, and eventually you would embrace ours, but it was still kind of that thing, right? Right. So, Ghoulies is also, uh, it started its own franchise, um, which obviously you you had 
a great influence, a great shadow over. But how do you feel about the films that followed? I don't know. You know, uh, I it's. <clears throat> I, I don't. I don't really. I don't think about them very much at all, to be honest with you. I, I just. I don't. Um, <clears throat> nobody ever really capitalized uh, to date on what Ghoulies could actually be. We didn't even do it. We didn't do it, and they. They certainly didn't either. Um, Jeffrey and I, for the longest time, have been trying to get a, a reboot um of ghoulies off the ground it's complicated um but i think that um the potential for ghoulies like the real potential for ghoulies like just as an example i mean joe dante hit the gremlins potential right out of the park from the get-go right yeah. um and we didn't, we really didn't get to do that. And um, we really didn't get to do that. And um, I don't think that the sequels did either. I would agree with that. Um, I would say the second and third films kind of more directly kind of become a Gremlins Critters thing. Yeah, but then, yes, yeah, so, but that's exactly right. They become sort of a hybrid of other things. Do you know what I mean? They don't. Yeah. I mean, okay, so they have you know little you know little you know creatures in common, right? They have, right. but I think that once Gremlins came out, listen, when originally I said this is. You know what? What are the funny things that these little creatures could be doing? You know, Beekler was like, <laughs> you know, was like, "What do you mean? You know, what? What do you mean?" Because he he saw it in a completely different way, and to him, these were frightening little creatures. Um, um, but they they're not. They they weren't. Um, but uh, like I said, I don't think anybody's really tapped into what ghoulies could actually be you know especially in this day and age you know to sort of reinvent the form um would be something magnificent uh, so let's talk about beekler for a moment because all of his work has a very um signature look to it and yes. i think ghoulies might be the film that solidified it in most people's minds it's kind of um it's kind of a a frond fantasy look but it also has kind of a intentionally um i don't mean this in a pejorative again like like you said before but it, it's an intentionally unfinished almost look to it whereas things are allowed to look almost as they would naturally they're not over they're very stylized but they're not stylized to an end does that make sense yeah uh, listen <clears throat> john did a lot with what he had you know we're, we're talking about i mean he lived pretty much exclusively in the low budget world and you know prosthetics uh, and animatronics and all of that stuff is expensive expensive stuff that takes a lot of time um and time and money was something that john never had ever not on anything and so i think john really you know he made, he, he had a really serious career doing what he did and carved out a niche for himself and kind of a signature, a brand for himself. Definitely. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, to see John with his creatures, he, he inhabited his creatures. His creatures really were an extension of him. Um, and, um, and yeah, they, I think you put it well. I mean, they 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 were they weren't polished. They weren't slick. They weren't you know. They, they, it's, we're not talking about aliens. You know what I mean? We're, no. they, it was they were rough hewn. They were rough. They were rough. They were chiseled from marble. You know what I mean? And um, and again, I think that that was really more a function of time and money than anything else. You know, he wasn't a Tony Gardner. You know, he. Yeah. He just didn't. I don't know whether 
it's not for me to say whether he had the chops for it or not, um, but uh, I can tell you for a fact that he never really had the time or money to like really develop and research and you know um, uh, develop his creatures to a point that they they were anything other than what they were. Do you know what I mean? But you you can kind of see that in the entire um, Empire system, like in every aspect of the filmmaking. So I think for Ghoulies in particular, it really works because it's kind of the aesthetic of that shoot it fast mindset anyway. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, he'd eventually go on to be a director in his own right. Did he, and that, that always is the mark of a good special effects person who understands how this stuff has to be shot. Was he at that point in his career um, uh, helpful that way? Um, you mean in his early, the earlier part of his yeah, I mean, sure. John would chime in and 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 you know make suggestions and stuff, and we had a, a great working relationship on set. Um, um, I think I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I think John really sort of fully. Um, I know he wanted to do. I would. I I I I ran into him much later on after while he was doing his directing stuff um but he still stayed within that budget range he still stayed within that sort of genre you know what i mean so i don't think even as a director i don't i don't think that that you know i don't think that his uh special effects makeup stuff benefited from the fact that he was a director. I think it was still operating within the same boundaries of time and money. Okay, so Ghoulies comes out and it's a pretty big hit for an independent film. Um, in certain regions, it was competing right alongside the titles that people were, that were the movies du jour of the day. So um, how does that affect your career going forward? It didn't really do anything. I mean, to, to be honest with you, uh, it didn't really, it wasn't like there were, people weren't knocking on the door and people weren't you know yeah we uh we did we we made a lot of money you know but this we this movie was made back in the day when you made a movie the presumption was is that it was going to be a that theatrical release that was the right. presumption you know it wasn't much uh, else no yeah exactly um and um uh we outgrossed rambo i think on one weekend you know in New York, um, but um, it made absolutely like no impact on my career at all. I mean, I I had directed a movie, yay, yay team, <laughs> you know. So, how does Ro how does Rockula come about? Um, again, so Jeffrey and I. Jeffrey said, I have an idea for a movie. It's called Rockula. I go, okay, cool. So let's talk about it. So we talked about it and I, you know, I spun this really dark pre Anne Rice story that, you know, it was like Romeo and Juliet if Romeo were a vampire and set against the LA underground rock and roll scene and, you know, this whole curse that followed her. And it was dark. It was dark. It was really, really dark. And um, we had, uh, I, I wrote the script and uh, we went out shopping and we went, we took it to Canon and it went into development, it went in, into development hell and it got rewritten and all of this stuff and it then languished for a long time. And I, I said, you know, we got to, we had, it's like somebody shit or get off the pot, you know. So we, I went in to have a meeting with Menachem and I, I just loved Menachem. He was just what a guy. What a what a character. He was eating lunch, doing an interview, watching dailies, and meeting with me at the same time. And he goes, you know, he's like, we're having this conversation. So, Rockula, how much? How much? How much you are? I said, you know, about two million dollars. Why so much? Why so? Much? All right, all right. Listen, you're in pre-production. Make it a comedy. <laughs> just change everything. Just do. I, I swear to you that exa that's exactly <laughs> what happened. Now, here's what it, here's what it was. 
We had a title, Rockula, and we had a script, and the two of them fought each other, right? And the title won out over the script. So we, um, we turned the whole concept on its head and said, okay, suppose our vampire is the biggest loser on the planet. Like he's such a loser that, you know, like he, he's such a loser that, you know, you know, vampires aren't supposed to have um, uh, reflections in the, the reflection in the mirror. Well, suppose he has a reflection and suppose the reflection talks back to him and tells him what a loser he is, right? And, uh, you know, like they're supposed to turn into bats. Well, suppose he turns into this, like, like this bat dork. We could, we could, the name in the script was bat dork. Um, and so, you know, on and on and on and all this stuff. So, it, so we did that. And, um, and that too, in its own right, has become uh, like a, like sort of like this perennial cult film that, you know, people just, you either love it or you hate it, you know? Um, uh, but there are enough people, I'll tell you what, there were enough people who loved it that triggered the Blu-ray deal with Scream. There's a lot of films that don't make that jump. A lot. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it definitely there definitely is an audience for it. And and it was a film from a period where being a fun movie was enough to get people to to pull the trigger and and go to the theater. Well, so the the sad the sort of the, the coda about Rockula is that Man so it was Yoram Globus and Menachem Golan, right? They're mm -hmm. two cousins. And when we made Rockula, it was at the end of the Halcyon days for Canon, right? And yeah. the, uh, Menachem and Yoram were, were at each other's throats. Um, we finished the movie, Menachem ended up leaving the company and he was the one champion of the movie. He was the, and when he left, Yoram, who didn't get the movie at all, buried it as fast as possible, opened it up uh, in, you know, to, 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 to satisfy some contractual agreements, and then they buried it. They just, they just buried it. And it's also another reason why there's not a soundtrack album for it, because they just buried the film. And it wasn't until sort of years later that it started creeping up into a new generation of people who said, did you see this fucking movie called Rockula? It's fucking crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, it, it, it sort of grew into its, I, to be really honest with you, I don't think that Rockula was made for that particular audience at that particular time. It was really kind of more like a time capsule that was planted for a future generation that to look back with some fondness and some nostalgia at, you know, at the bygone 80s, you know what I mean? I think that, that um, the analog in so many ways is to De Palma's Phantom of the Paradise. Yeah. A film that came out and people shook their head and said, what the fuck is that? But today, you know, I mean, if that came up as a criterion just tomorrow, you wouldn't blink. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. I... And I think that there was something going there. I mean, at the end of the canon years, honestly, unless there was Death Wish in the title, it seems like they didn't know what to do with anything, just to be fair. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was really sort of like a crazy one-off for them, too. I mean, they they made their bones on the, you know, Van Damme movies. And, I mean, they, they did make a couple of good, great movies. Runaway Train was a great movie. Barfly was a great movie. The stuff they did with yeah, Toby Hooper? Life, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but those were kind of sort of the punctuations surrounded by, you know, a whole lot of schlock. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. And I mean schlock lovingly, by the way. Yeah. Um, I, I find that sometimes we forget that when we look back at movies, the ones we remember tend to be the more outrageous films. Sometimes the respectable things of the day are completely forgotten. Yeah, it's true. No, it's so, true. So, yeah. um, so let's go forward a little bit. Uh, um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about Dark Tide. Um, Dark Tide was a script written by Sam Bernard. I've known Sam for you uh, since high school, and um, 
we you know we i think we did three movies together we did the uh, dark tide then we did the chain no we did dark tide then we did the granny and then we did the chain together and um this was you know again sort of like intentionally you know what this was this was um what was the movie um not out of season but um I don't remember. It was sort of lifted from another movie, um, but this was, you know, um, you know, sort of uh, sexy thriller kind of thing, um, and um, so I didn't really have a hand in the script really at all, um, and. Uh, you know, we went to go shoot it in uh, in the Philippines, um, which was awesome. And um, Bridget Baco and Richard Tyson and uh, um, um, and uh, Chris Sarandon. I mean, they were they were all all three of them were just awesome. And we got some pretty great supporting people out of uh, out of uh, out of the Philippines. Um, and um, you know, we stayed pretty much true to the script you know um it was it was it came out exactly the way it was supposed to come out you know now was that originally intended for cable which is where it spent a lot of its life right yeah i think that by that time sort of the 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 model in the the model had changed where it, it wasn't we, you weren't really ever talking about theatrical release. It was all about, it was all about DVD, um, and it was all about home entertainment. Um, uh, I think in that order, really, it was sort of DVD and home entertainment. Um, so w no, nobody was under any sort of like, you know, misconception that this was going to be some sort of low budget release. It just didn't happen anymore like that yeah i mean it's it's right in that time period where even before jurassic park for by a few years but like there was a sea change whereas summer entertainment spectacle kind of took over the whole map and the smaller yeah. films just seemed to get crowded out about that time um the reason i i actually spotlighted it is it's like the other thing that um i think most genre fans may not have seen from you but um I think it's a good spin. I, I think I think a lot of people would enjoy it. Oh, it's a pretty it's a pretty good movie. It's a, I mean, yeah. it's okay. It's okay. And, it's a, it's it's pretty good. And we have a lot of Chris Sarandon fans uh, from all of his work in the genre. I think they should give it a spin definitely. So I wanted to spend a moment on it before we go to the Granny. Yeah. Now the Granny is a trip. It's it's one of those films that um, you almost don't believe exists until you see it. So how, how did that? What was the impetus to start that ball rolling? Sam Bernard came to me and he said, I want to do this movie called The Granny. And we, 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 we talked, you know, it's, we came up with the story together and, um, and I wrote the script and sort of, you know, borrowing from my past with Ghoulies and with Rockula, it's like, this is going to be gross and it's going to be fun and it's just going to be, it's going to be, it's not, it's big and it's crazy and it's not going to be, it's not going to pretend to be anything other than what it is. We're not pretending that this is like a straight ahead horror movie. It's, you know, it's a, it's a really twisted piece about twisted people. Um, and, uh, and we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, and we did. I mean, we shot it in 18 days, um, and everybody was game. And um, there's some really just, there's some funny, funny setups and funny gags and funny lines, and, and still pays off in the sort of like in the, in the, the in, 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 in the horror genre with regards to you know the comeuppance that the family gets and the blood and the you know uh and and all of that so it was uh it was it was a lot of fun to make so what i'm going to say your four genre films it's definitely the um the broadest and the 
probably most in, intentionally untethered. Um, was it a time when you were like just let to? Was there studio control at all on that? Or no, talk about so, producers so control. It was. I mean, I made it for Tapestry and for a. Uh, a vision i think it was or warner vision no for warner vision which was a warner vision was a um was a label under warner brothers but they did music videos and then they briefly branched out into films and they hated it they hated it so much they just hated it um and uh what to do uh you know um yeah they hated it they really really just loathed and despised that movie so is there a chance going forward of uh a, a high def release of the film in the future i mean i know physical media is fading fast but is there a chance there there's a chance there is a chance you know there there's a a, a guy named justin roach has a Listen, a guy named Justin Roach has a granny. He is a granny super fan. He has, he collects all the international copies of all the international like D, uh, the VHSs. He's got all the the one sheets from all over the world. He's got like he's got like a corner of his house like dedicated to the granny, and he, he's <laughs> a super fan. And he's got a page on uh, on Facebook. And everybody should just go join it, um, and you know, because this is how it worked with with Rockula, where you make some noise, and then Scream Factory like takes notice and says, "All right, we're in." You know what I mean? So, when uh, did you work with Scream Factory on, on the Rockula release, or? Yes, I mean on the, I mean we yes, um, we came in and we did. Uh, we did interviews. We did an, uh, uh, a commentary track. Um, we gave him as much as we could. I mean, back in the day, you know, the behind the scenes stuff, you just didn't really do that kind of thing. You did, you know, they just did, just didn't exist. Just um, one more cost. Rarely, yeah, more cost. And, and rarely did you, you know, even do production stills. I mean, uh, not really. You know, and if they were done, they were doing separately, probably than the actual shooting. There were no well, they, they, you you you'd have a guy come out for a day or two and like shoot some stills, and that was it. And for your key art, and but um, nobody really took that stuff that seriously back in the day. So I want to shift gears for a second. Um, as an actor, you've been in about seventy films, and while they might not be. Um, in in the film side of it, it it's it's a kind of in the lane of what your career has been but on television you were like across the board you were like a constant television face in the 80s if people were looking for you i mean you're on simon and simon airwolf um mike hammer miami vice mantis uh, uh walker texas ranger a few years later i mean how, how do you how did that occur was that always something you wanted to do as act or uh, well, that was how I started out in the industry was, you know, I, I'd always been writing, um, but uh, I started off uh, professionally as an actor. Um, and, you know, shortly on the heels of that, and Jeffrey, Jeffrey Levy and I, you know, formed a partnership and um, we were writing a bunch of stuff and, you know, we had a housekeeping deal at MGM uh, developing uh television concepts and uh we sold one of them and wrote the script and we you know so we i'd always been writing so shortly after that i mean um you know um i began sort of the tertiary career as a director and all of these things you know from my perspective are sort of fit together like pieces of a puzzle you know uh, i um uh, they're all they're different functions in the same world, but they're all kind of really very closely connected to one another. And um, and I felt very comfortable with that. And actually, I mean, I really felt comfortable with that. So um, the I was never like a pure actor. Like there, I know act. I have friends, actor friends who that's they're just actors. They don't want to write. They don't want to be 
directors. They don't want to be, they're just actors. And that's what they do. They're just actors. And I was never, that was never me. I mean, I, I, yes, I have, and I still have like, you know, a, a career as a, as an actor and I, and I really like acting, but I was never good at just sitting, you know, essentially waiting for the phone to ring. You know what I mean? Like, you like to make something your own, keep yeah, moving. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you're not, if you're not swimming, you're, you're sinking, right? Yeah. So, um, I want to go to a little dicier of territory. Um, you were with both Empire and Canon at, at different points in their longevities. Yes. But you didn't return to either. Now, with the case of Canon, there wasn't much opportunity by then, but you didn't really um, work for Empire again or Full Moon afterwards, which obviously inherited most of the behind the scenes. Was that an intentional thing? Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, um, you know, Charlie and I, not Charlie and we, um, came to loggerheads over um, the fact that we never really saw anything. We never, we never saw anything from the back end of Ghoulies. We never saw anything. So um, we sued. Um, and, and at that time, that's when Empire um, went belly up and the library got sold to, I don't know, the Sar Louis or I forget exactly who. Um, and just to clear up the library, they made, they made like a ridiculously low offer and we took it. I mean, really tiny offer, so, so, but so that kind of cleared, that kind of cleared the relationship between Charlie and I. So it, the, do, does, so you're in Je you and Jeffrey's screenplay, does it, the rights currently sit with MGM then? No, MGM just has the, the DVD rights. Um, that who the we the remake and sequel rights fell through a lot of different hands and we've had attorneys look at this we've we've been chasing this down for a long long time and we have not been able to determine who actually owns the remake and sequel rights so mgm mgm has the dvd rights that and yeah, for the, the just the DVD rights, the, the so, distribution rights. So you, the, the issue for you now is that you and Jeffrey would have to um, find out who owns it in order to terminate the copyright. Because no, it's not about termin terminating the copyright. It's about um, it's about finding out who has the the remake and sequel rights um, in order to reboot ghoulies or remake ghoulies ghoulies or you know do anything with it you know i mean so, you've hit you've hit the point now though you couldn't you can terminate that you could claw back the rights you're past 35 years yes you you're absolutely right unless it was a work for, for hire. hire was it a work for hire yes okay well then it's not negotiable uh well we it say that we say that at some point there might be a challenge, and I think a good argument could make it be made legally that even work for hire doesn't mean what the law needs it to mean for it to apply. Um, yeah, but, but I'd have to find I'd have to find that person. I'd have to find that entity to make that argument too. That's which true. That's been the that and and listen, Ghoulies has remained dormant since Ghoulies Four. It's just been remained uh, Ghoulies Four. I think. The production company was um, they're still in business I forget um, and I at one point I contacted them they said no we were just the production company I, I don't really we don't really have any you know uh, documentation on that um, that seems kind of unbelievable yeah <laughs> uh, but it, but but the fact of the matter is is that Ghoulies has remained dormant all these years, all these years. So what up? What up with that? Yeah. You know what I mean, I mean it's, it's, 
it's it's really it's really trippy it's really weird if you if you didn't have the roadblock in front of you would you may would you go forward with a remake or a sequel absolutely in a heartbeat which would be your preference uh, a re to total reboot so that you could maximize the a, to a total reboot um so we could really kind of make it like what it was pay homage to the original um but take it into this day and age you know from every perspective that not not just from a story perspective but also from a, a execution perspective um and uh and have it be something that isn't just a throwback or a callback to a different era, but belongs in this universe, you know, because, you know, audiences today are way more sophisticated than they were back in, back in 1984. Do you know what I mean? Way more sophisticated. Yeah. So um, it's not about making, it's not about making bad schlock. It's about making, uh, a really great like i mean just uh, as is just sort of a uh, it's like making it on the level of a gremlins do you know what i mean for yeah. this for this time period for this day and age okay. which has, which has a different sort of story story sort of requirements as well do you know what i mean so um yeah we're 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 hot to do that um so and we're still on the trail we're still we're still we're still trying to figure it out well on, on behalf of of the entire horror community i can tell you we're everyone's on your side we want this to happen and we'd also nudge you on the shoulder and say go light on the cgi but we all want it to happen yeah uh, there's something yeah. about ghoulies in particular that cgi i think would be um almost an offensive turn um, maybe to animate some of it, but the, we, I think puppets are still the way to go. Yeah, but good puppets, like and like sort of like really good sort of animatronic yeah. puppet, you know. Absolutely. So, where do you what, what are you working on now? Where do you want to work, and um, what's the future well, look like? Well, uh, <clears throat> presently, um, <clears throat> I, I, you know. I've been for the last over a decade. I've been producing movies here in in Hungary, <clears throat> and um, and then subsequent in 2016, I teamed up with a Qatari team that was making their um, debut uh, series, and I teamed up with them. That went well, um, and I've joined them. Um, I, I now work with a studio called Qatar Studios based out of Doha, Qatar. Um, and we're developing um, some really bitchin' content. So that's an interesting thing, too, because I th um, anyone watching my channel knows that I'm constantly saying that the future of film is very clearly not centralized in Hollywood. Uh, my favorite films from the last few years have all come out of places like India and Indonesia and Turkey, places that traditionally you wouldn't think of as film hubs. But there is a wonderful thing that technology has done, which is decentralized the ability to make films. Um, you can make a film anywhere in the world and it can compete. Now, there's a lot of things that go into that, like money and talent and whatever, but there's not the roadblocks there used to be. Would you agree? Totally, completely. Are you kidding? I mean, you know, um, technology has democratized, you know, the, 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 the ability for anybody to today make a movie, you know what I'm saying? To make a movie. Um, and it's not about, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, it now, now it rests on your ability as a storyteller, you know, to work with what you have, but the quality of it, um, you know, you can compete. You can compete with anybody. You know what I mean? So yeah. Um, and also, we've become um, we 
have become decentralized, as you say, culturally as well, where we're now um, really sort of taking in uh, films from other countries and really enjoying films from other countries, you know, like you know, the, the Koreans, the Chinese, the, the, you know, you know what I mean? So, Absolutely. Um, so in, in that part of the world, in, at least in Qatar, you know, film is a nas is in its, the film, the film space is in its nascent place. But what I really loved about being in Hungary and, and also love about being, uh, in Qatar is to view the world through that particular lens and tell those stories and help, you know, be a bridge um, for those particular stories to get traction in, you know, in the rest of the world and, and find the commonality, sort of the, the, the commonality of, of, of story elements that um, will, that do have legs and will translate into other parts of the world. That's a, it's a magnificent, um, difficult, but magnificent challenge. Um, and I, I, lo I love being a part of it. And we can't wait to see what's next. Yeah. So where can people follow you online to keep up with it, what you do have going on? Um, katarastudios.com, K-A-T-A-R-A studios.com. That's a, that's a great start place. Um, I've never gotten my shit together enough to actually put my website up. I keep thinking about it and talking about it, but I just haven't found the time to actually do it but katarastudios.com would be a great place to uh to, to start awesome i want to thank you for coming on today and having this talk with us. uh you are one of those guys that when we talk about movies and ghoulies comes up your name comes up and then people look you start to have a blank stare because i don't think that you've done quite as much press or been asked to do quite as much press and this isn't you know, high press, but I know there's a hunger to hear from you and to hear the empire story. There's still so much curiosity about that time period with independent genre films in America. And I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing. And uh, if you ever want to come back, just drop me a line. If you have anything to promote, I'd be happy to do my part. Awesome. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the show will be back on Monday with kind of a freeform community episode. So if you're out there and you want to come on and have a few minutes to speak your piece about what's going on in your portion of the genre, just scream at me. Otherwise, everyone, please have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>